In this video, we focus on two topics. One of those two topics is the ways that dienes are classified. We're going to use three terms to describe the classification of dienes as isolated, cumulated, and conjugated. We will also compare the stabilities of these three types of dienes, learning about what drives why some types of dienes are more stable than others. In later videos this chapter, we will look at reactions specifically of conjugated dienes to compare and contrast the reaction types that conjugated dienes undergo relative to other types of dienes, particularly isolated dienes. And based on your knowledge from Organic Chemistry 1, you should already be familiar with how to name dienes. So we're not going to go into nomenclature of dienes in this chapter, but you should be able to take names of dienes and convert them into structures or vice versa based on your prior knowledge of organic chemistry. So let's go ahead and get started and look at comparing and contrasting the different types of dienes so that we are able to classify them according to the arrangement of the two alkene groups within the diene molecule, because dienes, as you will recall, are molecules that have two alkene groups, di, indicating two, ene, indicating alkene. So in a diene molecule, we describe the diene as being isolated if the two alkene groups are separated by one or more sp3 carbons. So we define an isolated diene as two alkene groups that are separated by one or more sp3 carbons. And the reason why this distinction of sp3 carbons versus the sp2 carbons of alkenes is important is because having sp3 carbons inserted between the alkene groups is going to impact the reactivity and stability of the system. So we describe the alkene as being isolated. For example, if we have an alkene group at this end of the molecule, alkene group over here, and in between those two, there would be an sp3 carbon atom because this carbon in the middle here has four groups bonded to it, so it's sp3 versus, as always, the alkene group carbons are always sp2. So in the isolated diene, you do not have a continuous system of sp2 carbons. Instead, you have this system where sp2 carbons are interjected with one or more sp3 carbons along the way. A second type of diene is what we refer to as the cumulative diene or the cumulated diene. So in this second, much like a cumulative final rolls everything together into one, the cumulative diene or cumulated diene is a diene where you have the carbon-carbon double bonds running into one another. So the carbon-carbon double bonds in this situation have no other carbons in between them. So you have directly adjacent carbon-carbon bonds. So you have this carbon in the middle here that's part of two different alkene groups. And if we look at the hybridization of these, the hybridization of the carbons at the end of this system, and by the way, those hydrogens could also be R groups. It doesn't have to be CH2s at the end. This molecule could be larger than just three carbons, in other words. But those two carbons at the end are going to be sp2 carbons. And then the one in the middle there Counting the number of regions of electron density to determine the hybridization state, this carbon has two regions of electron density here and here, no lone pairs, and so it's going to be an sp hybridized carbon because sp indicates that there are two regions of electron density. And so the accumulated diene is going to have sp2 carbons on the edges of the alkene group diene and here in the middle, an sp carbon. That makes it fit the definition of cumulated diene. So cumulated diene is by definition just having this pattern of two alkene groups that are running into one another with that sp carbon in the middle. Then finally, our third type of alkene group is what we refer to as 
the conjugated diene. We are going to spend most of this chapter talking about conjugated dienes because there are some special reactions that conjugated dienes will undergo. With a conjugated diene, what makes the conjugated diene special is that it is going to have two alkene groups present in a continuous sp2 system. So rather than having the sp2 carbons of the alkene groups split with having an sp3 carbon interjected or an sp carbon in the system, instead the atoms will be arranged so that there is a continuous sp2 system throughout the conjugated portion of the molecule. And in the case of a diene, we're referring to a system where we have just two alkene groups that are part of this sp2 continuous system. The word conjugated, though, can be more broadly applied to refer to larger systems of trienes or polyenes or other types of scenarios where there is a continuous string of sp2 hybridized atoms within a molecule. And so in order to accomplish this conjugated system in a diene, what will always be the case, the pattern that you will see, is that you will have alkene, single bond, alkene as the pattern. And looking at the hybridization states of all of those carbon atoms, we recognize this as meeting the definition of conjugated because all four of those carbons that I've highlighted with my blue arrows are all sp2 carbons. And the fact that this has a continuous system of sp2 carbons confers stability. This is one reason why these conjugated diene systems and conjugated systems in general will undergo unique types of chemical reactions relative to isolated dienes and cumulated dienes is because of this continuous system of relatively stabilized sp2 carbons. They are relatively stabilized because of the fact that the electrons reside within low energy bonding orbitals throughout this system. And we're not going to go into the depths of molecular orbital theory to explain this, but in essence, due to the fact that the electrons throughout this system are in low energy bonding orbitals of the pi bonds in particular, that is going to enable this system to be highly stabilized relative to isolated and accumulated dienes. So we'll see some special reactivity occurring as a result. In the case of isolated dienes, isolated dienes react analogously to general alkenes. They don't really have special types of reactions that occur based on the fact that there's an isolated diene. They're just going to react analogously to any old alkene group. So each of the two alkene groups in the molecule would behave independently, reacting in traditional addition reactions. Cumulated dienes are relatively uncommon, so we're not really going to focus on the reactions that those undergo. Conjugated dienes is what we'll look at in depth in this particular chapter. Now that we've delineated the different types of dienes, we can look in more depth at the stabilities of the different types of dienes. As we alluded to just a moment ago, dienes are stabilized by conjugation, by that series of sp2 hybridized atoms or a continuous sp2 network. That is the number one feature that we are going to look at as stabilizing dienes. A second feature that will stabilize dienes and alkenes in general is having internal carbon-carbon bonds rather than carbon-carbon double bonds being at the end of the molecule instead being internal. So having, looking at an example of just uh, standard alkene, if we compared these two alkenes, 2-butene versus 1-butene, the more stable of the two would be the one on the left because of the fact that the alkene group is internal, meaning it's not at the end of the chain. It's here in somewhere in the middle of the chain. It has carbons on both ends of it. Whereas in the terminal alkene right here on the right for 1-butene, this is a less stable molecule due to the fact that the alkene group is at the terminal 
of that molecule. And this is the basis for Zaitsev's rule, which we talked about back in Organic Chemistry 1, which is where we could predict the alkene product of elimination reaction as being the most alkyl substituted alkene because we said that that most alkyl substituted alkene was more stable. It was more stable because as a general rule, having alkene groups within the interior of a molecule is more stable than having them at the terminal of the molecule. So the two factors that we can use to stabilize alkenes or dienes in general is conjugation is going to create a stabilized diene by creating a continuous sp2 network of low energy bonding orbitals, and then having internal carbon-carbon double bonds. So looking at these two factors together, we can compare the stabilities of different types of dienes. We can do this systematically or experimentally by measuring the heat of hydrogenation. That is a way that we look at the relative stabilities of alkenes and dienes. Heat of hydrogenation is the amount of heat that is released when we carry out a hydrogenation reaction. So to evaluate or compare the stabilities of different alkenes experimentally, that being just monoalkenes or dienes, to evaluate their stabilities, we measure the heat of hydrogenation. That's the heat associated with the addition reaction where we bring in hydrogens and add them across the carbon-carbon double bond or double bonds. And we measure that delta, that heat of hydration as our delta H naught value. So we'll be reporting those as we go through. And looking at these heats of hydrogenation, the reaction that we would be carrying out is we would be carrying out a reaction with an alkene or a diene, so we're defining the alkene here very broadly. React it with an excess of H2, hydrogen, in this hydrogenation reaction. That always requires a metal catalyst and yields an alkane product in this addition type reaction. And we look at the amount of heat released. We measure that delta H value to determine how exothermic this reaction is. And the greater the amount of heat that is released here, the less stable the molecule was. So the higher the delta H value, the less stable that alkene was. And so if we were to carry this experiment out for a series of different types of alkenes, meaning al molecules that have just one alkene group or molecules that are conjugated versus not conjugated, molecules of internal carbon-carbon double bonds versus external carbon-carbon double bonds, we could piece together some general trends in what we would see in terms of the relative stabilities and the heats of hydrogenation, keeping in mind that the larger the delta H value, the less stable the compound is going to be. So let's take a look at an example problem here to start sorting out how to interpret this information about the delta H values. We're going to ask of the alkenes that I'm going to draw below, which of these will have the highest heat of hydrogenation, meaning the least stable molecule, and which will have the lowest heat of hydrogenation, meaning the most stable of the molecules. And as my examples, I'm going to draw out three different dienes for us to evaluate. So I'm going to draw this diene out. I'm going to also draw out this diene as well. This is transhexa 14 diene for those keeping track of names and things. And get my structure drawn correctly here, like so. And then finally, we'll go with this one. And this last one I drew is trans penta 13 diene. I will also, for good measure, go ahead and add in here a fourth one, which is accumulated diene example. So I'm going to draw an accumulated diene penta 12 diene, like so. And we're going to ask which has the highest delta H and the lowest delta H. So things that increase the stability include conjugation having internal carbon-carbon double bonds, and as well, thinking about the fact that we have accumulated diene here, 
accumulated diodes are the least st stable. So we can add that as an addendum to our business up here is that accumulated diodes that have that SP carbon in the middle of the chain there are the least stable. So they have the highest delta H value of all of these different types that we're looking at. So which of these has the highest delta H? I'm going to go ahead and straight away plug in that my accumulated example has the highest delta H value. The highest heat of hydrogenation is the least stable molecule. And then among the others, we need to evaluate whether they are conjugated or not, and whether or not they have internal carbon-carbon double bonds, where conjugation is the most important factor in assessing the stability of these. So conjugation, I'm going to answer for each of these whether yes, it has conjugation or no, it doesn't. For this example that I'm circling with my laser pointer here, our case of penta 1,4 diene, this is an example of an isolated diene because it has an sp3 carbon in the middle here that I'm highlighting with my laser pointer. So we would put an N here and say, no, it does not have conjugation. Next one we're looking at is also a big no, it does not have conjugation because we've got this sp3 carbon in there. And then the last one here, yes, that is conjugated because we have a continuous sp2 network. We have sp2, 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 this continuous system of sp2 carbon atoms. So that is conjugated. And then with that in mind, Conjugation being the number one factor in determining stability, we can say, since only one of these four molecules is conjugated, that this one in the far right is the one with the lowest heat of hydrogenation. So this has the lowest delta H value. And then of our two non-conjugated alkenes, we have to look more deeply to determine which one of these two would be more stable. So conjugation stabilizes. There's no conjugation there. Internal carbon-carbon double bond stabilize. So look at these two. The structure on the left has only external carbon-carbon double bonds here and here. The structure on the right, on the other hand, has one of the carbon-carbon double bonds as an internal carbon-carbon double bond that I'm circling. And so that is going to result in stabilization there. So we can classify these based on internal carbon-carbon double bonds. And in the case of the structure on the left, there's no carbon-carbon internal bonds. On the case of the right, there's one. And so that's going to make this structure more stable. So this is going to, if we call ranking number one, the one that has the lowest heat of hyd hydrogenation, second place for second smallest heat of hydrogenation would be this one. Third is our non-conjugated molecules, no internal carbon-carbon bonds. And then the worst, highest, heat of hydrogenation is going to be the one that has the accumulated double bonds. So this is a strategy to take when you're thinking about which molecules are going to be most stable versus least stable. And we assess that based on the heat of hydrogenation by imagining that we were carrying out a hydrogenation reaction to convert the alkene into an alkane and measuring how much heat is released in that exothermic reaction as a way of measuring the stability where the more heat that is released, the more exothermic the reaction on the other hand, in other words, the less stable the starting structure was. And we can look at the structural features of molecules and predict what their heats of hydrogenation would be. And in case you're wondering from a numerical standpoint, if we had accumulated dyne such as this, the heat of hydrogenation for a mole of that would be around 292 kilojoules. On the other hand, for our best case scenario here, our lowest heat of hydrogenation, most stable molecule of this lineup, our heat of hydrogenation would instead be about 225 kilojoules. So 225 versus 292 is a relatively large difference in these heats of hydrogenation. So as we continue through the rest of this chapter, we are going to be focusing primarily upon conjugated dienes and the specialized reactivity that these molecules have based on the fact that they have that continuous sp2 network that results in the molecules being relatively stable compared to the other types of dienes.